Thank you, Peter. Thanks for the introduction. And thanks to Cathy and the team in London for putting this together. It's a nice change to be in front of real human beings again, um, and not just little squares on a um, Zoom call, although some of you have masks on. Um, I apologize for those that uh, have difficulty understanding my German accent, yeah. But I promise I will not make any German jokes, because they would not be a laughing matter, and laughing, I think, is as dangerous as coughing, probably. What I would like to do is to tell you a story, and then to examine that story in terms of where we stand today. And uh, first is fiction, and then comes fact. A lot of you will not know that Elon Musk and I have close friends. We message on Signal almost every day. And um, a lot of you will not know that Elon Musk, besides just doing things like uh, space travel and trying to send people to Mars, or doing things like brain-computer interface, he's also a big fan of time machines. In fact, he has built a time machine prototype, and he recently asked me if I wanted to, uh, to take a ride into 2030. And he said I could, I could go to London to see if, uh, if uh, Britain has rejoined the EU in 2030. I could go to uh, Washington DC to see if the capital is still there. But I said, no, I want to go to uh, a cargo ship in Southeast Asia and see how, um, how uh, maritime works in 2030. So he said, no problem. And I went to a cargo ship, a container ship, and I could see from the, um, from the radar that we are going to go to Singapore. And on the ship, the captain welcomed me and said, welcome on board. You will be the next uh, engineer, because the previous engineer, uh, they were all wearing wearable at that time uh, for health, uh, health screening. And it's all being monitored by an AI for, for around the clock. And the previous engineer had shown some potential problems down the line. So the AI decided that person needs to be onshore for a full checkup. So I was, uh, I was in this role. And um, I said, but I'm sort of, uh, I've been onshore for a long time. I'm really a little bit out of it. And he said, don't worry, I've checked you out. Um, I looked at the blockchain enabled digital health pass. And I could see that you are immune against COVID-29. So that's good. Uh, and he said, um, I also saw that you're playing a lot of virtual reality training games uh, while you were onshore, and I could see that you're often in the leaderboard of one of the best uh, three players. So I think you're qualified for that. And I said, OK, if you think so. Then he put his goggles on me, and he said, um, the charterer uh, that uh, had used a digital twin and run their AI through that and found that generally it's all pretty OK. But there was one problem or one sort of irregularity they wanted to check out further. So one of the inspectors was going to call, and I should go down to the engine room. So I put on the goggles. Didn't know where the engine room was, of course, but I just followed the green, sh uh, green arrows in the heads-up display. And as I was um, starting to go down to the engine room, I heard a voice in my goggles saying, you forgot to put on your helmet. What had happened is there are cameras all over the ship, and the AI behind that had seen that I was not wearing the proper helmet because I've been on, on shore for too long. So I put this thing on and went down to the, to the engine room. And then a call came in. I said to the goggle, yes, pick that up. And the voice of the inspector uh, was speaking in Mandarin. Now, I don't understand any Mandarin, but it just took a second or so, and then it started being translated into English. So then we could communicate. I also didn't really know how to do inspections. So, but I used this contextualized checklist that popped up in front of me using this, this augmented reality thing. And once in a while, because the inspector, she could see exactly what I was seeing through my eyes, so to speak, in very high resolution. And once in a while, she said, can you stop? Can you look at this from a slightly different angle? Or you know, try to run some additional test. Um, so we did that, and she was, uh, she was fine with the, the results of the inspection. At that point, I get another, I heard the voice of the captain again, who said, come on deck quickly, incoming drone. And I thought, oh my god, incoming drone, what could that be, piracy? But then I realized in Singapore, as everybody knows, as everybody knows, uh, piracy is not legal. So that cannot be that. And then there was this swarm of autonomous drones flying to all the vessels on Perth and the anchorage. Some of them were even moving, and they were delivering all sorts of goods to them. And I saw one drone coming to our vessel and delivering this, this big package. And I wasn't sure what's, what's in there. But my goggles had already realized what's in there through an RFID tag, probably. 
and were telling me this was a bunch of spare parts that the AI that was monitoring uh, the high frequency data that was coming from the ship had predicted would have a 60% probability to fail on this journey. So what it had done fully automatically, it had gone out and ordered from the next 3D print shop along the coast the spare parts and it was being delivered, was put on by robots on the drone and was being, being delivered to, to our vessel. So when I took these things to the storeroom, the, um, the, the little voice in my goggles told me um, this you know, was already added to the, to the inventory. So I thought that's, that's pretty good. If maritime looks like this in 2030, I think I can get on board with it. But then I got another call from the captain uh, saying the intrusion system had just uh, identified malware that was attacking the navigation uh, systems. And it was also being shared uh, with the Singapore threat, uh, threat analysis and sharing network that was established uh, back in 2026. So I thought, well, that's, you know, that's really interesting. He had already assembled a, a team of international uh, experts from around the world to deal with that threat. And luckily, it was at this point that Elon Musk whisked me back into the present just in time for the conference. So as you can imagine, that was the fiction part. Um, if we look at uh, some of the technologies that would be needed to enable that kind of a future, I think we can say for the most part that the future is already here. It's just not equally distributed, as William Gibson famously said. So let's take a look at some of these technologies. Uh, AI, 3D printing, sensors, and all of those things, and you guys are involved with some of them, are obviously all here. The pace is an interesting, the pace of the way the technologies develop. So it's not just where they stand today, but how fast they have come here and how fast they, they will uh, continue to develop. And since it's all about exponential growth and exponential improvement, something, some change that took maybe five years to come uh, to, to fruition, that same type of change might take just another two or three years for, for the next decade. And then there's some interesting synergy between some of these technologies. So AI, for example, enables robotics. Uh, quantum computing will probably give another booster to AI. So there's you know, really interesting synergy between all of these technologies. If you look at the pace, these are two pictures of supercomputers back in 2001 on the left side in 2021. They're roughly sort of the same uh, weight. I think the left, left one is 106 tons, the other one 150 tons. They cost 160, 240 million dollars. But if you look at the many orders of magnitude improvement in processing power and storage, that's very, very significant. And that's sort of, we often, I think, forget, because we live in the present, how things looked just a few years ago, and we don't think about how that will evolve in the next few years. Another is, example is probably something that's in your pockets, or that you might be using now, which is a modern smartphone. It has a gyroscope, uh, accelerometers, uh, positioning system, not just to one GPS system, but to multiple. Um, it has a LiDAR sensor that a few years ago was this big bulky thing on the Google Street View cars. Uh, so it's, it's uh, computational photography, it's just absolutely amazing. The uh, neural network chips, you know, all the stuff that is in a modern smartphone. And it's probably, I would argue, that it's not so much military that drives in innovation anymore. It's more the consumer technology, particular, you know, the mobile, because Maritime innovation benefits, obviously, from a lot of this technology, which is becoming lighter, less heavyweight, um, uh, cheaper, of course, and more powerful. Another example is virtual reality. My favorite virtual reality headset here is the one in the late 1950s. Can you imagine how, how that would be? Uh, or the one from the, from the late 60s. If we look at more modern headsets, uh, 2001, you still had to cope with a lot of complexity and inconvenience probably to the extent that, you know, in Maritime would say, we don't even look at this thing, it's not quite there yet. Headset from today, I would argue, uh, is at the point where it is actually usable. Uh, and we are using it, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But then again, in two or three years, this, you will hardly notice these things anymore. So that's, and the graphic quality is, is another interesting question. Once it reaches the capability of your brain and your, and your visual channels, your human eye, there's not much point in going beyond that. Uh, so that's you know, something that is, is really powerful and drives a lot of the stuff. AI, two, uh, ten, just 10 years ago, 2010, AI was still in this sort of AI winter. People were not, you know, they sort of lost faith that this would ever go anywhere. It's only in 2012 that a combination of hardware improvements like using GPUs like NVIDIA or software advances, all of a sudden it became really powerful. 
If we then look at the improvement just over the last four years, so here's DeepMind, you might have followed that, it's owned by Google. Uh, in 2016, it was winning first the European champion and then the world champion, where well, the world champion thought you know, he would be in no trouble because he was so much better than the European champion. So that was the, the game Go, which is much more difficult than chess. Uh, but at that point, you still needed to give the rules to the machine. It needs to look at 100,000 or millions of games and learn from that. So it's, you know, and it could only do one thing. It could only play Go. A year later, you only had to give it the rules, and it was still only playing Go. A year later, in 2018, it could play multiple games with the same algorithm. It still needed to know the rules. Just one month ago, in December last year, um, DeepMind published a paper that it doesn't need to know the rules anymore. So it just observes what's going on. It derives from that, that what the rules might be of multiple games, by the way. And then it learns how to play it and it becomes the best in playing it. I find that a little scary, um, but that's the, the progress of AI. Um, practically speaking, um, Kenneth mentioned earlier, EPS runs an accelerator for maritime innovation. And we're in the second year now, we have 18 startups that cover a lot of the, the areas of innovation that will be necessary for you know, the broader term of remote operations. Let me give you a couple of examples. So here's a NERMO that um, taps into the switchboard to analyze electricity consumption pattern of devices and then uses deep learning and machine learning to detect anomalies and predict failure of components. So that is already exist, we, we use it on ships. Uh, Captain's Eye is a company that uses just standard cameras. Let me show you um, sort of a video here. That uses standard cameras to detect if somebody is not compliant with wearing you know, the proper PPE, uh, to detect where somebody is simply in the wrong space at the wrong time, like uh, during mooring operations. And this is technology that is uh, you know, becoming just more and more powerful. The, the use cases for this are probably endless. And then on the drone side, F Drones is a company also in our accelerator that is developing a 100 kilometer, 100 kilogram freight drone. Interesting thing here is it's using a hybrid approach. So that's you know, something that uh, will fly uh, very soon in the next few months, um, a prototype here in Singapore. And we're using and have been using it already for up to sort of five kilometers so far. So that's an example that's already here that will do this, this autonomously. Other examples in some of my favorite subjects and I think very relevant for remote operations are augmented reality and virtual reality. So Serokan is a company from, uh, from Singapore. In fact, 50% of the companies of the 18 are either in or from uh, Singapore. Silicon is a company that uses AR goggles uh, integrated into the, into the helmet for remote inspections, live video streams, and so forth. Kanda, I'll talk about, is, has built a virtual reality uh, environment. Let me show you how um, one example of augmented reality that we're trialing today on ships uh, this in fact is, is uh, tone coverage. Thank you very much. Uh, credit here. Um, interesting thing Scan is, QR. this is using voice as the interface mechanism. Obviously, you don't want to use a keyboard or do some other clunky stuff. So here, even in noisy environments, the operator can talk to voice and listen to voice. He's doing inspections or overlay. This is the information that the person there would see overlaying what they see sort of in, the, in the real environment. So that's an interesting thing because the usability, the kind of interface voice, I think, will play a key role. That's one example. Let's look at another example. Augmented reality may assist in the daily inspections and maintenance tasks offshore and in similar industries. Each inspection point is marked by a blue circle. Open and interact with the inspection point by gazing at it for a short amount of time. Every interaction point has information that describes the object and how to inspect it. Also using voice as input and output. The application features proximity checks. An administrator may decide how close the inspector must be to the inspected object in order to complete the inspection. These are examples of augmented reality that is that 
least in the trial stage. And if there's a finding, it can be documented be immediately. Document the finding through speech to text. Running this kind of for remote inspections where people cannot get on the ship. There is a screw loose. This was not a German accent, it was a Danish accent, in case if you didn't notice. Um, Canada is a company, well, from Denmark, um, that is coming to Singapore that has developed. So, in the beginning, we'll see a short introduction. We'll go through sort of the basic stuff to be aware of. But now we can see we're out in the manifold area. We can see down in the bottom left uh, side of the screen, there's a step by step guide on what we need to do. So, the first procedure here is looking at the flag. After that, we need to call into the bunker barge. For that, we'll need the VHF radio. So we can see in the background, Jermaine is ready to perform the, the exercises. But to do that, we'll first turn to the correct channel. We'll open up, and we can see that our option here is reporting in that we are, we are ready to contact. This is Bunker Barge Beta. I read you loud and clear. Go through that. We'll get an Confirmed. audio reply. And once that is done, we can see down in the bottom left corner, now we're ready for the next exercise. The plug-in of the ESDS cables that we can see Jermaine is doing here. I remember how to do it because you have to bend down, take this thing and put it in there. And because you do it, it's building So there is a step-by-step -step guide with the blue highlights it's coming up. It's a and Jermaine then plugging it in and can release it when it is highlighted as white. Assignments to property specialists. It could be, you know, this was actually conducted, we've done various demos here uh, with students in Singapore and teachers in, uh, in Denmark, so it doesn't matter where people are. Um, this allows also to do refresher, so you don't have to go to academy. By the way, this was designed before COVID, and then with COVID, of course, now it's almost impossible to send people to Denmark to, for engine training or to Korea. Uh, so this, I'm, I'm very convinced, will have uh, a strong future. Other, ca other sort of technologies uh, represented in our accelerator, one is Nautilus Labs. Uh, they use freq high frequency data analysis from, from many, many sensors, overlay things like weather information, uh, and then do uh, performance uh, optimization for the engines, for generators, for, for route and voyage information. And this is just getting more and more sophisticated. They know a lot about the individual performance of a ship. Um, and this is another example, I think, of moving to, um, to remote uh, monitoring. Blockchain contracts, I'm not going to talk about that uh, because it's uh, too buzzwordy. Uh, plus, uh, it's one of those technologies, I think, that, that is very powerful, but in 10 years, nobody will talk about it anymore. This will be embedded and used, and you, know, you just don't think about it anymore, uh, I think. Now, the other sort of unspoken, so these were the accelerator. This is not in the accelerator, not yet. Uh, the unspoken underlying uh, capability in this 2030 scenario was also that we have high-speed internet uh, that is reliable. And we have, you know, obviously lots of satellite people here in the room. I'm thinking, why don't we have a mesh network? Because most of the ships will be in radio distance of each other most of the time, probably. Why can't they transmit data securely and fast, you know, like the internet itself? And only if you have to go to satellites, you go to satellites. By that time, you will probably use satellite constellation, constellations of small swarms of small nano satellites that will be in low orbit as these things are already getting underway. So this is not not quite, uh, quite there yet, and I think one of the challenges, but I think all of the underlying technologies exist and there's no reason we, we couldn't improve that as well. Um, yeah, so in summary, I really think that the technologies, the innovation capabilities are already here. We need to work as a group, we need to collaborate on distributing it more evenly so more people can use it uh, and faster. I think it's up to us uh, as a challenge. The benefits are obvious, economic benefits, uh, benefits to seafarer health and, and, and safety and well-being um, and sustainability, so reducing emissions. So that's, I think, the challenge for all of us. Thank you very much. Could, could, could we ask you to stay there for some questions and answers, and if but I may? You might move it to the, the panel uh, for the Q&A. No, I think we will have a few more minutes okay. to, to Q&A now. Um, thought I could escape. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, f first of all, I would like to say that yesterday you tried to make me an instructor for, for uh, LNG with the Kanda product. It was very immersive and very impressive. And uh, we, we must also try to remember that we're dealing with a new 
uh, breed of seafarers yes. uh, that we have. Uh, they are millennials or will be millennials more and more. And they have a completely different propensity to these kind of tools. Uh, and and uh, that also goes into training as such when you when you do um, the, the old style trainings versus a gamified version of that and and you talk about retention of, of knowledge probably you would have made your your experiences there yeah yeah absolutely i think that's a very good point i didn't uh, forgot to mention uh, even when we did the first demo sort of the older captains and myself included there was one uh, demo that we did for for fire escape and basically the other old captain and myself we died <laughs> and gil ofer who is more of a gamer kind of thing he survived because you're right it's about generation having grown up with these uh, so our sons i think would be perfect for this kind of thing but it's also i think attraction and retention i think having modern training methods uh, like this i think will just make it more attractive that's almost what people expect uh, and find in other industries so i think that might become a point of differentiation and gamification is something that's a, an interesting point also that we haven't built yet into these uh, technologies but you could imagine the LNG bunkering thing you know it's actually it's a pretty boring task but if you make mistakes in chapter five we have an explosion if you make mistakes it's very nice also but you could have you know teams play against each other who does it correctly in the least amount of time kind of thing and again sort of gamification is something that I think will be important for. If I may start with, with a question to you, uh, being so active uh, in an accelerator in, and in the startup space. If I look at our exposure to that, uh, the biggest uh, challenge that we see is what you mentioned in your last sentence. It's the commercial model um, where the benefits on economically uh, are very often not visible. Uh, there's problem statements and bottlenecks, we all know that. Uh, but how do you think can you improve exactly that? Uh, dollars and cents, because that is unfortunately the only decision trigger that we have experienced. No, that's a very good point. Um, so I think there are two categories. I think some can deliver clear value today. Uh, let's take you know the virtual reality training. I mean, our cost has gone through the roof because of COVID. <coughs> and we can put clear dollars if we can save hotel cost, trainer cost, and so forth. Um, there are others like, you know, F drones is probably a good example where you have to have a little bit of faith in looking into the future um, to make sure that, you know, this will be viable. Uh, although, you know, even with that one, we had situations where we cannot bring our own people on our own vessels. And in that case, we could actually fly the augmented reality kit, which does work, uh, I think, also using F drones to fly to the ship. Yeah, it's not 100%, you know, you cannot use it in 100% today. Uh, but I think it's a combination of some, you have it today, others, if you see the potential and you believe the potential long term, then it's a very good idea to get involved early to make sure the processes work around that. And I'm Morning. an optimist.